I would like to welcome everyone to the 27th annual Karen E. Wetterhahn Science Symposium, a celebration of undergraduate science research at Dartmouth. Um, this symposium is honor, in honor of the late Karen Wetterhahn, professor of chemistry at Dartmouth. Um, she co-founded the Women in Science Project, um, one of the groups that is heavily involved with today's poster presentations. Um, Karen's love of science, her desire to see more undergraduates have early research experiences inspired this symposium. So today we are celebrating this spirit and all of the undergraduates who participate in science research this academic year. Um, we are particularly excited today to welcome Dr. Juliet Madden, um, our keynote speaker. Dr. Madden is an associate professor of epidemiology and pediatrics at the Geisel School of Medicine. She is also the clinical director of the Children's Environmental Health and Disease Prevention Research Center at Dartmouth. She attended medical school at Brown University and did her residency in pediatrics at Maine Medical Center. She then moved on to Tufts Medical Center to earn a master's in clinical care research while completing a fellowship in neonatal perinatal medicine. Today, she is talking about a second life, microbe human interactions beginning in infancy, as well as giving us a glimpse into her career path. Get these controls to work, we'll be good. <laughs> Great. Can you hear me? Great. Thank you so much. It is um, such an honor to be asked to share a little bit about my research today, especially um, at the Karen Wetterhahn Symposium. Um, Karen worked in the um, Superfund Research Program and worked with the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences for much of her work. Um, she tried to understand how environmental toxicants impacted human health. And I, um, as a representative today of our Children's Environmental Health and Disease Prevention Research Center at Dartmouth, um, I'm very honored to be able to speak at a symposium named after Karen. So thank you. So I was asked today in 35 minutes or less to explain 10 years of research. <laughs> so, um, and a little bit about my career trajectory as a physician scientist. So I'm going to keep it at nine or 10,000 feet. So I apologize, I won't be getting into the weeds uh, about all of my research, but I wanted to tell a story and, and hopefully um, inspire some of the undergraduates who are here today uh, to choose a career in science that includes research. So I am a, a neonatologist, I'm a pediatrician with special training in intensive care medicine, and I work in the intensive care nursery, or the NICU. And so um, I started my research career a little bit uh, backwards. I started as a fellow after three years of pediatrics training, and in subspecialty training in medicine, we have about two of the three years are mandated as research time. And when I started, I met a couple of mentors in my program at Tufts who said, well, you're going to get a master's degree and you are going to do research. And I was panicked because I didn't know really what that meant. But I knew I had some questions. And I was really excited to have incredible mentors in my fellowship who helped me translate those questions into research. And so my big question was, why are babies, full-term babies in particular, but also preterm babies who are breastfed at all, why do those babies have different health outcomes for a lifetime? Well, that was this is an unanswered question when I was training about 20 years ago. Um, it still remains somewhat un unanswered, um, but the health differences in babies who are exposed to breast milk are vast. Babies who have, have breast milk have a lower incidence of childhood onset cancers. They have lower incidence of, of obesity. I mean, the list is very, very long, um, but there was no information when I was training about why that was. The other part of my question came from the NICU. So you can see a baby in the top right who was born at less than a pound. Um, she was born about 14 weeks early. And we knew in our NICU experience that we didn't have to wait very long to see health outcomes. So I took care of a baby named, I'll call him Matthew, who was um, pictured in the right upper corner. He survived um, for eight weeks in the NICU. So he survived not being able to breathe, not being able to eat. He survived multiple open heart surgeries and infections, and we were just getting to the place where he was about to take a bottle and learn how to breastfeed, and developed an intestinal complication 
that was caused by bacteria that resulted in a life-threatening infection. Within eight hours, he went from taking a bottle to dying. And so in the NICU population, we're able to see impacts of breast milk, but also bacterial colonization that's abnormal that resulted in disease that was life-ending. So we're able to see that much more in real time in my care in the, in the NICU. So my work stemmed from some of these really basic questions. Um, why is breast milk good for us? And why is abnormal colonization of the intestines result in disease? So today I have a brief outline. I'm gonna talk about how I got started. I got started, so you do your work where you live. So I started in the NICU studying the infant microbiome in preterm infants. I was then really fortunate to start working in large, healthy populations because we can talk about what's wrong in kids who are sick, but we need to know what's right in kids who are healthy so that we can base the work that we do on correcting um, in high-risk populations how to tailor the microbiome towards health. Here in the Environmental Health and Disease Prevention Research Center at Dartmouth, we study exposure. So in healthy populations, how do things like arsenic in our well water um, how do things like antibiotics or being delivered operatively by C-section, how do those impact the microbiome in the intestine and how does that relate to health outcomes? And I'll end with a really brief look at the work that we do in cystic fibrosis. So I started a cohort of babies in 2009 here at Dartmouth. I study every baby born in the state of New Hampshire with CF. Cystic fibrosis is a genetic condition that results in complications in the intestines and life-threatening complications with lung infections and unfortunately results in premature mortality in, in the 30s. Um, the work that I've done in my CF cohort here at Dartmouth with a multitude of collaborators, please don't think I do this by myself, um, has begun to be translated into therapeutics and that's really where I'd like to end today. So this is what we do. We look at exposures, so normal exposures like feeding, toxicants, I look specifically at the microbiome. How does it interact with immunity? And how did, might it result in dysbiosis or abnormal bacterial colonization in the gut? And then how does that relate to health outcomes? So as a physician, my hope is that we can impact health um, either with interventions or by changing the exposures at the get-go. I was asked to talk, too, about my career in science, so I didn't really know I was going into science when I went to med school, and I know that sounds crazy, um, but I thought I was going to be a doctor, um, and I didn't really think that much about how that related to science, careers in science or, or research, um, and I felt really, really fortunate to interact with people who encouraged me along the way to turn some of my questions into research questions. And I have to say, it would not have been without passionate questions, things about which I felt really excited. I wouldn't be here to be doing research. Um, it's also a little bit of serendipity. So bumping into people, looking out for mentors or people who are doing work that you find interesting and intriguing, follow in that path. You may not do exactly what they're doing, but you might do part of what they're doing, and that's definitely a path for success. Mentorship, mentorship, mentorship. You can't do science without finding someone to do it with, and now I can't do it without my tremendous collaborators. I was asked at lunchtime today about my family. I have five kids, and um, they have certainly shaped my path in terms of my research career, um, and I can end with that. And now my students, my students and the people I'm helping to mentor are asking new questions and moving our research program in ways I had never even imagined. So I'm learning from them, which is really exciting. And it's not a straight line. It's a messy, life is messy, and it's very much an iterative process. So we ask a question, we get some information back, and we go back to the beginning. And we know a little bit more the next time we ask the question, but it's not, not a straight line. So when I first went to the NICU for the very first time as a resident, um, I had to scrub. So I took my rings off, and the guys had to take their ties off, and we take our stethoscopes off, and we scrub up to here, and it's, we try to be as sterile as we can. And when I was a medical student here at Dartmouth, um, we were basically only taught about bacteria as pathogens. What are bacteria going to do to kill you? So wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. So we take off our ties, our wedding rings, um, and we really talked about bacteria as the enemy. So there was a war on bacteria when we were training in medicine. And if I don't shake your hand when I meet you, it's partially because of that. <laughs> 
now, just in the last 10 years or so, because we've been able to translate the ability to sequence the human genome, now we're sequencing bacterial genomes. So now we're just starting to understand there's this vast universe inside of us, inside and on, side, on, on top of us, in our skin, in our respiratory tract, in our gut. We have trillions of bacteria living in and on us, and they outnumber us. There are more bacteria than there are human cells. And there are some science fiction people who actually like to think that we are simply vectors <laughs> for our, to carry our bacteria around, that we don't actually have lives. So I don't think that. Um, but <laughs> I don't believe that. I think we're still in charge. Um, but there's more of them than us. So it's pretty exciting to think about. The other thing that I like to think about as a baby doctor is that we have evolved over millennia to require microbes to live inside of us to train our immune system when we're newborns and, and young babies to metabolize our food. We wouldn't be alive without the bacteria that live in and on us. And they metabolize toxicants like the arsenic that we're studying. Um, they metabolize the drugs that we take. Um, so I think actually babies, not only are they the cutest patients that you could take care of, they're also the most interesting people that we can study with respect to the microbiome because you and I have a pretty stable, static microbiome inside of our gut. Uh, babies are essentially sterile if they're healthy when they're born, and they start to colonize over the course of weeks and months through different exposures, and those exposures and that colonization pattern is interacting with that burgeoning immune system. And if that's changed with antibiotics or diet or surgery or hospitalization, we think that relates to health outcomes. So studying this time when there's so much change, we think is particularly exciting. There's a microbiome of the mouth, of the breast milk, of the gut, of our skin, you name it, there's a microbiome. Some of them are easier to study than others. Stool or feces is pretty easy to study. It doesn't hurt, it's free. Um, there, are other, there are other parts of the body that are a little harder to capture. Skin microbiome is a little harder to study. I also study respiratory microbiome in our babies with CF. Much of what's published in the microbiome world is somewhat conceptual and not necessarily proven. So this is a little bit of a backward science um, presentation, but it is theorized that we have a core gut microbiome, all of us across the world in the human population, especially in static people who are over the age of three up through adulthood. And around uh, that sort of core that we share it's probably pretty likely that there are variable shifts in our microbiome based on where we live. Do we have pets? Do we take antibiotics? What do we eat? Are we vegans? Do we eat red meat? Those things probably do shape our microbiome. But in general, in adults, the, our microbiome is very static and, and very stable. It's not in babies. So healthy babies have a very, very simple, almost, in fact, if you study the stool of healthy babies, at the time of delivery, which I've done, um, there's really nothing in there. If you study very high-risk preterm babies who are very sick at birth, they have quite a lot of bacteria um, in their gut at the time of delivery because of exposures in utero. Um, but if you look at the bottom, I'm sorry, I don't have a pointer. <laughs> the bottom, um, there's very little diversity to start at birth, and as you move to two to three years, you're starting to see more and more bacterial diversity. You also see at birth, there's a lot more inter-individual variability, and that's what we're trying to study. What is different about that four-month-old baby compared to that four-month-old baby, and how are their health risks different? And we're looking at everything from asthma and allergies, which are becoming much more um, common in our healthy populations in the United States, which we think is related to the microbiome, um, and we're looking at obesity risk, um, infection risk in healthy populations, and, also, and we also study um, high-risk babies who are sick. What does the microbiome do for us? So it confers resistance to infection, and this is adults and children alike. Reduces our susceptibility to inflammatory or metabolic disorders. Um, we know some interesting epi studies have shown that diversity of the microbiome in the first weeks of life relates to allergy and obesity at school age. We know that our vaccine efficacy and our drug metabolism is influenced by our microbiome. And then specific diseases, so from a pediatric perspective, Bloodstream infection is associated with the microbiome in the gut, allergy, obesity, IBD, even psychiatric illness, which is a new area of interest of mine that I'll be studying hopefully soon. 
um, autism, um, and then long-term health outcomes like cancer and cardiovascular disease. And when I graduated from medical school, I took the Hippocratic Oath, and Hippocrates said, all disease starts in the gut. I actually believe that. <laughs> Why is that true? So back to babies. Um, this, when you're born, you have um, a very simple immune system that requires a lot of training. And so we know from animal models in particular, especially germ-free animals, um, that and this is applied to babies, innate and adaptive immunity has evolved to require interaction during development um, with microbes in order to be competent. Um, we know that certain exposures have profound effects on the microbiome in early life and that this might impact lifetime disease. What I'm interested in, and I love my friends who study the epigenome, but it's not alterable. The microbiome is alterable. So if we can figure out patterns that relate to disease in low-risk and high-risk populations, we can intervene. And it might be as simple as diet, um, but it might be a little more sophisticated than that. I'm gonna just show you one quick slide about immunology. I'm not an immunologist, but I play one sometimes when I give talks. So believe it or not, your intestines have a single cell Line. There's a single cell layer between the inside of your intestines and your bloodstream. That blows my mind. Um, so when you're a new baby and you are healthy and have very little bacteria in your intestines, there's a pretty typical pattern that we're learning about um, whereby with normal exposures like vaginal delivery and breastfeeding and no antibiotics, that your gut microbiome will develop in a specific way. Um, those microbes directly interact with all of the gut-associated lymphoid tissue that lives here underneath that single cell layer. And without that interaction, all of those cells that I mentioned on the other slide are not going to develop appropriately. We're theorizing that this is a critical window. So let's say zero to six months, zero to 12 months, when your immune system and your metabolic system are developing. If we interrupt that normal development with antibiotics for an ear infection, for instance, then you might see recovery of the microbiome because we can study that. But we're worried that there is a, there's a paucity of interaction with immune training cells or with metabolic cells that put those babies at risk for allergies, ATP, and obesity that we see in our epi studies. So the microbiota hypothesis, we used to call this the hygiene hypothesis, which you may have heard about. So this is coming to the idea that changes in the gut microbiome in, in the United States, um, such as from very, very frequent antibiotic use and poor diet. We have a, the standard American diet, uh, the, the short version of that is SAD, standard American diet. It is SAD. Um, we have, <laughs> most of us have a very poor diet, and we are exposed to a lot of antibiotics. So our children have an average of 18 courses of antibiotics in the first 18 years of life. Profound, right? So yes, there's antibiotic overuse. If you're sick, please take your antibiotics. Um, but um, we do think that perturbations of the normal colonization pattern relate to the fact that we have higher rates of allergy and asthma um, and ATP. There was a study published in New England Journal in 2016 that said, we've figured it out, <laughs> which no one ever does in science. They compared Amish children who live in traditional farms to Hutterite children who live on industrialized farms and looked at their microbiome, looked at their exposures to microbes, and saw there was a vast difference between their risk of allergies and asthma. And we think it's related to this early life exposure to bugs, that bugs are good. You can pick up the binky and put it back in your kid's mouth. That's good. I will jump over to some research, just as a commercial break. <laughs> We, we use the five-second rule in our family, so if you drop food on the ground, if it's been less than five seconds, you can pick it up because there's probably no bacteria on it. But somebody at Rutgers decided to study it, and actually, it's not true. Um, they actually dropped, like, gummy candy, and yeah, it's, there's bugs on it. So, <laughs> so what are we doing? So my group um, is trying to meet an unmet need in microbiome research. So a lot of the low-hanging fruit in my, human microbiome studies to start were in adults, and they were in high-risk adults who had inflammatory bowel disease um, or cancer. Uh, we're interested in more of what are the normal healthy patterns beginning at birth. Where do you start? When you start at time zero with tabula rasa, where are you going? Um, and how do high-risk populations in neonatology differ? 
Is there a variation? What environmental exposures shape it? How does this relate to immune competence? And then is this a critical window? Um, I will mention briefly that there's a very exciting study um, based in a, a population of children who are very high risk for developing type 1 diabetes. And in that group, those babies were provided with a probiotic, and the babies who had a probiotic in the first three weeks of life had less anti-islet cell antibodies present in their bloodstream by the age of three. So I'm not advocating for probiotics, but there's some very exciting research trying to get at whether or not, even in human populations, if there's a critical window. Because we're able to do that a little bit more easily in mice. How do we do our work? We collect a lot of stool. Um, it's free. It's very, um, it takes up a lot of freezer space. We do sequencing, like I mentioned before. So just like we apply um, DNA sequencing to humans, we do either targeted um, gene sequencing for our microbes, or we do whole genome sequencing, which we call metagenomics. And on the bottom, um, we're just starting to do metabolomics, where we're studying the metabolites that are secreted by the microbes. So we're looking at their actual function. Um, which is very exciting, and now I work with brilliant bioinformatics specialists who are helping to integrate that work. So how did my research career come about? I started in the NICU because I was always there, <laughs> and the nurses used to page me and say, "Some, I've got a diaper for you. It was very exciting. And then I finally got some students to work with me, and they would pick up the diapers. Um, and so I, I was trying to answer some low-hanging fruit questions. So why do my babies who are born at 500 grams develop um, intestinal complications related to that bacteria? Why do those bacteria translocate and cause them to have life-threatening infections? Very low-hanging fruit. Um, I then created the CF cohort here at Dartmouth um, in collaboration with George O'Toole and some of my micro friends at Geisel. Um, and then I was recruited in to work with Margaret Karagas, who runs the New Hampshire Birth Cohort Study, to build a, a human microbiome program within her center. And there's been steps, it's a cycle. <laughs> it's not linear at all. Um, George has been starting to take the work that we're finding in our CF cohort and has built a cell line model. We've actually discovered what's missing in kids' um, microbiome and cystic fibrosis in their intestines that relate to disease progression. And so George is studying why that might be in an epithelial cell model in his lab. I have nothing to do with it. I'm just really excited. <laughs> Um, now I have partners who are doing a mouse model with me, a CF-specific mouse model at Case Western to try to answer some of the more systemic questions about why differences in the gut microbiome and CF relate to systemic disease progression. And that's a lot easier to do in animals than it is in people. Um, in the healthy cohort, I was really excited to start with studying the infant gut. I moved on to metabolomics with Annie Hohen. We have a postdoc who's working on breast milk microbiome, which is really exciting to do that in collaboration with the gut microbiome work that we're doing. We're now starting to move back in time and study the mom's intestinal microbiome and her vaginal microbiome along with breast milk and serum metabolomics. And in that, I'm trying to get at the fetal microbiome um, through metabolites, which I'm really excited about. And then, of course, we're studying immunology. I'll briefly mention ECHO. So we were just welcomed into the Environmental Children's Health um, Initiative, which is a 50,000 mom baby cohort across the country funded by the National Institutes of Health. So our cohort here in the New Hampshire birth cohort is 2,000 moms and babies, and now we'll be part of a 50,000 mom baby group where we'll be able to ask big questions like, does BPA in your water bottle relate to autism risk? I can't answer that in the end of 2000 even. We need about 50,000 to do that. So I'm heading up some of the microbiome investigations within that enormous cohort. It is like a giant cruise ship. It's very hard to steer, <laughs> but it's been really exciting to see that we can maybe expand that work. And finally, we were just about to start some collaborations with some friends in the UK who have a very large cohort of young children with CF as well. And of course, we don't do this without a whole lot of people, and I don't have time to talk about them right now, but I don't do all this by myself. So this is what we do. We look at exposures on the bottom, microbiome, metabolome, immune development, and lots of high-level bioinformatics in the middle, and then we're looking at health outcomes. And this is a hammer that you can use to look at any health outcome, which is part of why the ECHO cohort has worked out so well for us. So how did I get started? I was in the NICU, my patients were getting very sick, which is still happening, unfortunately, sometimes, but I was interested in why. So the first study I did was in six babies, six, 
six. It's tiny. I don't know how I got it published. <laughs> but I got many samples. I got lots of poop. And what I found um, very briefly was that um, there was a pattern where the gut microbiome and these very preterm babies got very, very, very focused on pathogens just prior to the onset of bloodstream infection. It's very logical, but there was really no data. And then this brilliant fellow at UPenn took that information, made a mouse model, and published in Nature. Awesome. Go him instead of me. <laughs> and then I have some students who've worked on some of the more high-risk pregnancy questions around fetal exposures and how that relates to the preterm infant microbiome. And most recently, we just had this paper um, accepted for publication looking specifically at your gestational age at the time of delivery and how that relates to um, your gut microbiome. So my next step was having this opportunity to work with the New Hampshire birth cohort and 2,000 moms and babies trying to figure out what's normal. So it's very common in research to ask questions, in clinical research, to ask questions in really high-risk populations because they're sick. There's a lot of questions to ask. Oftentimes, like with preterm babies, there's a lot of very common and very severe outcomes that are measurable. Um, but there's not much I can do when I tell you that babies who are born early have a lot of staph in their gut. I need to know what's normal in order to try to fix it. And so it's been a great opportunity to be able to work with a New Hampshire birth cohort study and find out what's normal. This study is a big, big ship. Also, uh, we enroll moms during pregnancy, really early in pregnancy. They wear cool, live strong wristbands that cost $1,000 and measure all of their environmental toxicants during pregnancy for a week. Um, we do lots of things like that with this cohort. Kids wear air monitors, we collect urine, stool, toenails, you name it. Um, lots of data over time, water. We're studying arsenic exposure, among other things, from the environment and how that relates to health outcomes. So you name it, it's being asked and measured. My part of that is to focus on the microbiome. How do perturbations in the microbiome in early life relate to health outcomes? One of our first normal, normal, normal papers to establish what's normal was published in JAMA Pizza a couple years ago. We looked at the first 100 babies. Babies in New Hampshire are big, <laughs> and they were full term. They were almost 40 weeks. About two thirds of them were born vaginally, um, and they're pretty heavy, healthy babies. Um, so we're pretty proud about that. Um, most of our kids in New Hampshire breastfeed. So we have a very, very, New Hampshire and Vermont are some of the highest breastfeeding rates in the country. So we have a hard time finding formula-fed babies um, to use for some of the questions that we have, but we're happy about that. So some of this seems really, some of the work I do, people say, well, duh, we knew that. Well, we didn't know that, um, but we published it finally that infant microbiome gets more diverse over time. And, and the primary bugs that, were, that are um, present in healthy babies who are primarily breastfed are bifidobacterium and bacteroides, and this will be important later. We were surprised to see that delivery mode was the most important exposure in this healthy population in terms of overall community composition. This is a um, PCOA principal component analysis. So each little dot is a person, and um, it represents overall community composition at one time point. So in red, the babies born vaginally are very different in their overall gut microbiome at six weeks compared to babies who are born, I'm sorry, vaginal is red, C-section is black. And on the right, it's a volcano plot um, showing at the top in large pink balls that babies who are born um, vaginally are more highly uh, populated with bacteroides and bifido, and babies on the left side are populated more with staphylococcus. Babies born operatively are colonized primarily by the people who catch them and by the people who take care of them in the delivery room. Babies who are born vaginally, fascinating, but mom's vaginal and gut microbiome during pregnancy shifts to being really focused on lactobacillus, which facilitates that baby um, metabolizing her mom's breast milk. It's pretty cool. Feeding was also somewhat surprising to us. We imagined that babies who are breast and bottle fed, mixed fed, would look more like their friends who were breastfed exclusively, but we didn't find that. We actually found that babies who were combination fed looked more community-wise like their, their friends who were um, exclusively formula fed. And recently, we looked back at our data to look out to one year, and we're seeing that delivery mode impacts are persisting to one year. And um, the American Gut Project, which you can send your stool <laughs> for $99 out to California, and they'll, they'll tell you what's in your microbiome, um, they emailed us after this paper and said, you know what, we're seeing 40-year-olds who are showing a signal of being delivered by C-section in their 40s. So they think it persists, too. So we'll see. 
some of the metabolomics work that we're doing, this is untargeted metabolomics, um, and Annie Hohen is my collaborator who's really taking the, um, the lead on this. What I want to show you is that the metabolomics are mirroring the work that we're seeing on the microbiome side, which is really helpful. Um, and we're going to move from fecal metabolomics into serum metabolomics hopefully really soon. Um, Dupe Coker, who's one of my um, collaborators and who's a dentist by trade and an epidemiologist as well, um, she has just submitted this paper uh, that we've been working on for about a year, trying to understand the impact of antibiotics around the time of delivery and how those relate to the developing in microbiome. So again, if you think about it, from a science and health perspective, this is really simple questions uh, that we don't have the answer to yet. So 50% of moms in the United States have antibiotics at the time of their delivery, 50%, right? So it's, it's a lot. Um, we were interested in what type of antibiotics, how they were delivered, and how that impacted the baby's microbiome. Those antibiotics are given based on protocols that are apparently very, I know as a neonatologist they're important, <laughs> um, but we want to know if there's something we need to do about it. And so we were able to show that there is an impact that persists up to one year. Sarah Lundgren is one of our students who is working on the breast milk microbiome. She's actually found that there's two different breast milk microbiome types. Um, we're delving into this in relationship to the infant gut, and I don't have time to share that today. And then if you're interested in bioinformatics or biostatistics or math, um, Annie's working on this with one of her students as well, trying to use um, modeling using microbiome uh, models, which is able to take some of our work to the next level. So we're not able to do this work without very high-level bioinformatics, and she's trying to understand whether or not specific microbes coexist with others, um, which would help us certainly when we're thinking about trying to create probiotics. So I have two more questions, and I can get this done in five minutes, I promise. So from the environmental health perspective in the Children's Center, we're interested in this normal, 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 healthy microbiome trajectory, but how does it relate and how does it impact it by uh, toxicants? So when you think about environmental toxins, you can't think about them without thinking about the intestinal microbiome. Most of the toxins that we're exposed to, we eat, right? So we worry about fish and we worry about arsenic in our water and it's going into our gut and then it's being metabolized by the microbes in our gut. And for arsenic in particular, it's metabolized to things that are more toxic before they're absorbed or less toxic before they're absorbed. And so we were interested to see how that might relate to the infant microbiome in our cohort. There is no safe level for arsenic. It's like lead. If anyone ever asks you how much lead should you feed your baby, it's none. Right? And it's the same thing for arsenic, right? How, what's a safe level of arsenic? None. You don't want to eat arsenic, right? We used to use it as an antibiotic. It is actually used in feed for um, farm animals. So we use it as an antibiotic for the chickens that we eat. Um, and then we eat it when we eat those animals or their eggs. There's this bi-directional relationship. So arsenic is an antibiotic. It kills some of the microbes in your gut. And then it gets metabolized and transformed by the microbes in your gut. These are papers from the New Hampshire birth cohort that were a little hard to get published because people didn't believe it. So arsenic is studied in Bangladesh where the levels in the water are so high um, and they, they're associated with severe lung infection and with cancers. Um, here in New Hampshire, just having a little bit of arsenic above what the EPA thinks is safe um, is associated with lower respiratory infection in our babies here in New Hampshire and those healthy fat babies I was mentioning before. We were able to show that arsenic during pregnancy was associated with decreased T lymphocytes in the cord blood at the time of delivery, um, placental markers of immune function, and changes in DNA methylation. So even low levels, high low levels <laughs> in the United States have health impacts. So we wanted to look at the microbiome because that's our hammer. So we were able to see that there is overall difference in community structure at six weeks um, of age in babies who were exposed in utero to arsenic through their mother's well water. There are specific taxa that are, are depleted um, in arsenic-exposed babies, and this is from their fetal exposures. And then we were very interested to see that it's actually boys, not girls, who are profoundly impacted when it comes to the microbiome perspective. Um, and this is actually mirrored by other, pop other groups that are studying animal models. And I'm going to wrap it up talking about high-risk patients because it's in my CF work that we've begun the translation of therapeutics, and that's what we're really why we're here, actually. 
So I started, started the, I just named it because I had to name it recently, <laughs> the Dartmouth CF Infant and Children Cohort, so I can't leave Dartmouth now. Um, we've been enrolling prospectively all kids with CF in the state of New Hampshire unless they say no, and no one said no because I don't draw blood and I don't ask them to do surveys. Apparently that's really annoying. So we have about 85 kids now who were, we were initially wanted to follow them for 12 months and now we have eight-year-olds in the study. And it, we've gone through potty training with them, which was very interesting for a microbiome study. Um, it's a lot easier, <laughs> a lot easier to collect diapers. So we collect um, airway samples and stool samples. We've done targeted sequencing, and now we're moving more into, we're studying careful um, markers of disease progression, but we're now moving into metagenomics and metabolomics with a lot of support from the CF Foundation. We've been really moving things quickly in this project because we've been able to take the kids with CF and compare them to healthy. And that's been able to show us where the Venn diagram doesn't overlap so that we can come up with interventions. And we're doing everything you're seeing on the bottom with all of our omics technologies and following carefully um, immune competence, um, both with the healthy kids and with the kids with CF and their vaccine responses um, and looking at their antibiotic exposures. Our first paper in CF was not that long ago, um, but we were able to show this surprising. When I first asked the CF Foundation to fund us, I wanted to collect respiratory and stool, and they were told me not to look at the gut. What is, you know, what's going on in the gut? Um, as pediatricians, that's actually how cystic fibrosis starts. There's a lot of um, fat malabsorption, a lot of GI complications in early life, and then progressing to lung disease later in life. So as a newborn doctor, I was only seeing CF as a GI problem, not having any idea that actually the gut microbiome has a lot to do with cystic fibrosis and the systemic disease progression. And that's where we've gone. So we were able to see that colonization occurs in the gut before the lungs in our first paper. Our second paper, we were able to show that it's actually the gut microbiome and not the pulmonary microbiome that relates very carefully with health outcomes. We also saw that breast milk, which we expected, um, was very much protective against lung disease progression. So breast milk is chock full of healthy bacteria and all of the prebiotics that feed the healthy bacteria. So all the milk oligosaccharides feed the healthy bacteria. So we were able to see that kids who were exposed to breast milk and CF had longer time before their first really severe lung infection. And that it, here in the left lower corner, overall community composition in the gut was predictive of first CF exacerbation, not the pulmonary exacerbation. And that's when we thought maybe we're onto something. We expanded the cohort, and now when we compare it to healthy kids, we're seeing what might be really different. What we're seeing is that in the healthy kids, there are these beautiful stacked bar plots, but the only thing I want to point out to you is the large proportion of Bacteroides and Bifido at four months and one year in healthy controls. Bacteroides is very well known, as is Bifido, as a very important keystone taxa for immune training. And we're seeing that it remains pretty prevalent and even at one year for our babies in the healthy control. Our babies with cystic fibrosis at both time points have less than 5% of both bacteria. And, and most of our kids at the four month time point have not had any interventions, right? They're born, they go home, they're breastfeeding, they're bottle feeding, and they're taking some of their enzyme replacements. But they haven't had antibiotics or hospitalizations for the most part. So we're actually hypothesizing that our babies with CF have a different gut microbiome from birth. And that if we can identify what's different, we might be able to impact change to maintain health. Because these are beautiful, healthy babies who can stay healthy if we can figure it out. So if you look at it this way, patients with CF, this is their overall bacteroides relative abundance. Everything's less than 20%. Each dot represents a patient. So all the red dots are kids at zero compared to the healthy controls. You can, it's a better visual to see that there's a lot more bacteroides in our babies who are healthy. And we had to look just at the kids with CF to ask the question, how does the gut microbiome relate? And so I showed you earlier that the gut microbiome is related to CF um, pulmonary disease, and we're seeing that it's persistent at one year. I have to skip over because we're running out of time. So I've got lots of new exciting projects and lots of people um, working on them with me. But like I said earlier, we're moving backwards in time to study the maternal, vaginal, and fecal microbiome to think about vertical transmission. So how does mom pass down her healthy bacteria to her baby, and how does that relate to health outcomes? 
Um, I'm also really excited about studying neurodevelopment, and so we have a, just submitted a grant to look at the early life microbiome in relationship to autism-like behaviors and anxiety um, at ages three, five, and seven in the New Hampshire birth cohort. And then we're looking at metabolomics. I'm really interested in doing that in mom's serum to try to get at sort of this idea of the fetal microbiome. I actually don't believe that there's a fetal microbiome, but I believe there's a maternal microbiome that has metabolic impact on the fetus that may impact health. So this is, this is my brood, and um, they were born all throughout my training. <laughs> They're still here. And we don't do this um, work without a huge group, um, and it's been really exciting. The work that I do can't be done by myself, which has really been, I'd say, the most rewarding part of what I do. Um, Margaret Kergis is running the New Hampshire Birth Cohort Study, and, and George O'Toole has been running the show in the micro side for my CF work, and it's without them, I definitely couldn't be doing this. So thank you so much. that these newborns get, and how does that, have you looked at any of those, um, that, they, you, you, that they get in early life in the first few months, and how that affects the microbiome? I know I heard a talk on it once, but how does that affect your group? So um, Annie Hohen, who is um, one of our, part, my main partner in crime and the research, and she is about to um, embark on a project looking at the rotavirus vaccine. So there's, as you know, many types of vaccines. Um, but rotavirus is, is a pretty obvious application, I think, of some infant microbiome questions. Um, and I think her question is really focused on the fact that the rotavirus vaccine um, that's given in um, developing countries, in particular Africa, where we have many research partners, is nowhere near as effective as it is here in the United States. And so her research question is based on that. Um, it isn't a particular type of rotavirus vaccine, but it's, it's actually all, all of the three types that are available are less effective in, in that population. So she'll be looking at it from a microbiome lens. Um, so we're embarking on that soon. There is good data in adults um, that flu vaccine in particular, which is nice to study because we take it every year, hopefully we take it every year, um, is um, impacted by your microbiome. And especially, there's certain high-risk populations like people on dialysis who've been well-studied with respect to their microbiome and their response to vaccines. So it's a great question. And you know, a different asking questions from the live vaccines that we give enterally from the injectable vaccines that we're giving for, for non-GI related. So there's many ways to ask that question, but that's a great one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know your field is in the uh, natal side, but how quickly does um, the health uh, outcomes diverge with kids that are allowed to crawl around on the floor and play in the dirt to those who are not allowed? So, um, I think the best study I can point to is that nice Amish study um, where basically I think the theory is that if we let our kids pink, pick their binky up off the ground and stick it back in their mouth and we don't use dial soap and we don't, you know, we just let them interact with microbes or if, they're, if we farm ourselves or let them play outside in the horse barn, that they actually are at lower risk for developing allergies and asthma. So the data is pretty clear. Um, that some of the things that we did in the United States in terms of frequent antibiotic exposure and then trying to sterilize our children and their food exposures for like in the 80s and 90s, I think, um, that wasn't good for us. And so the data is pretty clear. Yeah, so you can let them drop their food on the floor. So even though the five second rule was debunked, it's okay to eat it. Yeah, I think, I don't know. Don't quote me, <laughs> maybe not in flu season. <laughs> Why they have, so what first was the reason why they have such a different gut microbiome? I mean, obviously, children that have CF metabolism is working different. I don't know if the difference in the mucus production and the type of mucus happens at, at that young age, but is it like the environment is selecting for a different group of microbes within their gut? And therefore, if that's the case, 
what does that mean for therapeutics? Because it's like their gut is selecting for a different group. Right, so um, we're trying to get at that question. Um, so we, we have to say, someone was asking me earlier about grant writing, <laughs> so let me give you the grant writing answer, <laughs> is that CF does ha result in intestinal local microenvironment and overall intestinal macroenvironment um, where there's different pockets of different microbes that like to live, right? That's true for all of us. But the mucus, the increased sort of thick mucus is part of the reason. Um, and so all of our babies who are pancreatic insufficient with cystic fibrosis are on enzyme replacement therapies and other therapies that are trying to help um, with the difference in the mucus that is part of the reason they have severe lung disease and GI issues. Um, whether or not the work that we do with replacing what's missing, just to keep it simple, whether or not that's effective in the same way that it might be in a four-month-old without CF who needs antibiotic recovery interventions, we don't know the answer to that. I doubt that they will be the same, um, but that's part of why we need people at Thayer and, you know, we need people to help us. Yeah. Time for one more question. Yeah. It seems like you have some really cool results about the bacterial microbiome. I was wondering, do you know anything about the fungal or viral microbiome and if that's changing in these patients? Thank you for asking that. So, um, so Deb Hogan, who is in microbiology here at Dartmouth, is an expert in the fungome or the fungal microbiome, um, or the mycobiome, actually, which not, it's hard to hear, but it's myco, right, which is fungus. Um, that's about as much as I know about it. <laughs> so um, when we do sequencing, we can see fungus, and we can actually see archaea, which Olga is here, I think, and so she can explain that for you, too. There's a lot of different types of um, microbes that are present in, in the gut in particular. That's where we house most of what we're doing. The virome is hard to study. It is, it is studyable. Um, it is accessible. Um, absolutely, when you talk about high-risk populations like cystic fibrosis, the fungus are um, extremely important to study. And most of the work that we do is has collaborative projects with people who are able to access the fungal question. Right now, we're at such a beginning stage that they're separated. Um, but my hope is someday that this will all be one large sequencing endeavor where we can say, all of this is different, and this is what we need to intervene with. So that's a great question, though. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much for an interesting talk. Um, we are now moving to the awards portion of the of the program. We have three awards, uh, or three groups that are giving awards. Um, the first one is the Library Research in the Sciences Award. And to give that, I would like to introduce Jennifer Taxman, the Associate Librarian for Research and Learning. Hello. Uh, this year, the library presents its fourth Library Research Awards in the Sciences. These awards are sponsored by the Friends of the Dartmouth College Library and the Dartmouth Library. And we strive to recognize students that demonstrate exceptional ability to conduct research in the literature of their field and who have developed an outstanding pattern of research and inquiry. We received many outstanding submissions this year, all of which were judged by a panel of librarians from the Kresge Physical Sciences Library and the Dana Biomedical Library. Two submissions stood out this year for their advanced literature review and sophisticated research strategies. We are pleased to announce that the winners of the Library Research Award in the Sciences are Hannah Margolis, Class of 2020, and Sammy Hahn, Class of 2018. You can come, on, come down. Um, Hannah is a sophomore research scholar and does research in Michael Ragusa's lab in chemistry. Her poster title is Biochemical Investigation of Mitochondria Autophagy Initiation in Saccharomyoses cerevisiae. Hannah's submission was notable for her connection of her literature review to the scientific process and its extensive bibliography reflecting diverse sources. This is great, right here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sammy is presenting her senior honors thesis work uh, from Professor Patricia Pioli's lab in Geisel. Her poster title is CDDO methyl ester attenuates 
uh, um, attenuates inflammation in healthy and systemic sclerosis macrophages. Sammy's submission was notable for her sophisticated research strategies and techniques. Please join us in congratulating Hanny and Sammy. Hannah and Sammy. <laughs> Let me give you. All right, our next set of awards are for the Senior Honors Thesis Sigma Xi Christopher G. Reed um, competition. This year we had the largest number of entrants, I think, ever uh, in this competition with uh, 40 Senior Honors Theses um, that entered. Uh, to present those awards, uh, and all of those Senior Honors Theses had to give presentations this afternoon to the committees. But uh, Professor Dean Wilcox, Chair of the Department of Chemistry and head of the Sigma Xi chapter of Dartmouth will present those awards. Thank you. Once again, the Dartmouth chapter of Sigma Xi is happy to partner with the Women in Science program, undergraduate research, to participate in this wonderful symposium that is a living legacy to my late and wonderful colleague, Karen Wetterhaw. Uh, for all of her impact that she had for many of us here at Dartmouth. It's just amazing that her name lives on in this, this wonderful event every year. Um, Sigma Xi is, uh, uh, is a scientific honor society that was founded in 1886 by students and faculty in the engineering school at Cornell University to honor science, scientific research, uh, as an honor society to recognize that. Uh, it has since grown to over 500 chapters and over 80,000 members worldwide. The organization publishes an award-winning magazine, American Scientist. It provides advice to government on all aspects of science, and it provides uh, grants in aid of research for many young investigators. Uh, the uh, the, uh, cha the uh, organization has grown beyond engineering to include all of the natural sciences and applied sciences, in particular biomedical science, as we was, was amazingly represented by Dr. Madan's research here. Uh, it also includes uh, the philosophy of science, history of science, and science education. So it's really expanded to include all aspects where science and engineering impact human life. Uh, membership in Sigma Xi comes at two levels. One is at the associate level for young scientists who show great potential for for making scientific accomplishments, and it also at the full membership level for those who have demonstrated, demonstrated uh, their uh, accomplishments. The Dartmouth chapter of Sigma Xi has two main events every year. One is an awards and uh, induction ceremony for new members, and the other is the Christopher Reed Science Competition that we hold every year at the Science Symposium. The competition is named after the uh, late Christopher Reed, a member of the biology department who was very active in the chapter and very active in promoting science here at Dartmouth. Um, as Holly just mentioned, we were shocked this year to find so many senior honor students uh, interested in participating in the program. It overwhelmed our usual capacity to judge the posters, but we adjusted thanks to Holly Williamson's uh, wonderful organization of the the uh, judging process. Uh, the panel of judges consisted of, there were seven of us, uh, Dr. Doug Van Sitters from the Thayer School of Engineering, uh, Dr. Timothy Smith from the Physics Department, back here, um, Dr. Robin Barbato from Krell down the road. I don't think Robin's here. She's picking up her daughter at the daycare. Um, uh, Eric Griffin from the Department of Biology. Eric's here. Um, and uh, Chris Levy from, uh, from the engineering school from Thayer, and finally Natasha Groats from the Department of Biology. So, so that was the panel of judges. Uh, and as always, it was terribly difficult to compare research that's done in astronomy to that that's done in microbiology, to that that's done in engineering. Um, and in fact, we were again overwhelmed by the quality of the science that was presented, that was done by Dartmouth students here. Many of these in most, many places would be you know, research that would be clearly at the master's level. Um, so and, so uh, we were really astounded by that. Um, 
all participants in the, pro, in, the part, in the competition will be nominated by the Dartmouth chapter for associate membership in Sigma Xi in recognition of their scientific accomplishments at this level and their potential for further growth as, as scientists. Um, so with no further ado, I'd like to announce the winners of this year's competition. Um, two, ask, two things, uh, first of all, I have a little ribbon that you can, the winners will put on their poster so you'll know who were the winners. Uh, and second of all, uh, the, the librarians at the Kresge Physical Sciences Library uh, will ask that you not destroy your poster but you give it to them so they can post it in the Kresge Library for the next year. So it will be there with your prize so you can show your parents at graduation and any other friends who happen to wander by. So. Um, without further ado, let me go ahead and announce the winners. Um, as usual, we couldn't limit it to one first prize, one second, a second prize, and a third prize. So we're going to start with the third prizes. So one of the third prizes this year um, for her research, development of a smart resistance exercise band to assess strength with her advisor, Ryan Halter, Emily Weschler from Engineering. Is Emily here? Are these bands on sale out in the lobby? One day, maybe. One day, maybe. They're patented, so you can't steal them. Okay, patented. <laughs> The second third prize um, for his research, predicting mercury levels in freshwater fish through environmental factors with his advisor, Celia Chen, Colin Backstrom from the biology department. is research on Nantucket. I wish I could do research on Nantucket. <laughs> the third third place prize for his research exploring GCXGC time of flight mass spectrometry as a diagnostic tool for prosthetic joint infections. Research with his advisor Jane Hill, Victor Borza from engineering. Time to move on to some second place prizes. Um, for her research entitled CDDO Methyl Attenuates Inflammation in Healthy and System Systemic Sclerosis Macrophages, research with her advisor Patricia Poli, uh, the one of the second place prizes goes to Samini Han for medicine. <laughs> Other second place prize um, for his research entitled Pre-Surgical Algorithm for the Optimal Planting, Plating of Mandibular Fractures, research with uh, Doug Van Sitters, Brett Seeley Hacker from Engineering. poster, you'll, you'll never want to break your jaw. <laughs> Finally, we did our limit ourselves to one first place prize. And this prize uh, for his research entitled Synthesis of an Elastic Hydrogen Bonded Cross-Linked Organic Framework and their associated monomers with his research advisor Chen Feng Ka, Samuel Kim from Chemistry.
The last set of awards are from the Women in Science Project. And I will announce them all and then ask all of them to come up at once so then everyone can get to their, to their posters. Um, first, I'd like to announce the two Women in Science sophomore scholarships. The Barbara E. Crute Memorial Internship honors Bar biologist Barbara Crute's PhD's memory. She guided many undergraduates as well as graduate students and postdocs in research and was known for her generosity, cooperative spirit, and academic aptitude and strong work ethic. The Barbara E. Crute Memorial Internship recipient is Melissa Wang. The second WISP sophomore scholarship is the Carol Folk Research Scholarship. This award honors the dedication and significant contributions of Carol Folt um, to the WISP program. She was one of the original faculty mentors of WISP Research Internship Program as well as a member of WISP's Faculty Advisory Committee. The recipient of the Carol Folt Research Scholarship is Odalis Hernandez Medrano. And this year, WISP is inaugurating a new award. We're calling it the WISP Research Engagement Award. For this, war this award recognizes WISP interns who have exhibited sustained engagement and enthusiasm about learning through research. This is the inaugural year, and the recipients are Shannon Sartain and Sarah Genowine. If you could all come up. Congratulations to all of you. Whoop, wait. Stay for a photo. Thank you.